If it's Tuesday, former President Trump returns to the campaign trail and ratchets up his anti-immigrant rhetoric to brazen new levels, bashing them as diseased criminal animals and blaming President Biden for a, quote, border bloodbath. Plus, the escalating fallout facing Israel, as the White House says it was outraged over the, an IDF airstrike on a humanitarian aid convoy in Gaza that killed seven World Central chicken workers, kitchen workers, halting the aid group's efforts in the war zone. And President Biden gets up, bets big on abortion rights in Florida, launching a new battleground ad following yesterday's court ruling that puts the issue on the state's November ballot as the fight over reproductive rights and the White House ramps up. Hello and welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Ryan Nobles in Washington. Former President Donald Trump is back to campaigning after a couple of weeks off the trail and wasting no time in deploying some of the darkest and most incendiary rhetoric we've seen from him on the stump. This afternoon from the stage in Grand Rapids, Michigan, he ramped up his language while characterizing the current situation at the border, a, quote, bloodbath caused by President Biden. I stand before you today to declare that Joe Biden's border bloodbath. It's a border bloodbath, and it's destroying our country. It's a very bad thing happening. The Democrats say, please don't call them animals. They're humans. I said, no, they're not humans. They're not humans. They're animals. Not one more innocent life should be lost to Biden migrant crime. The first step to restoring safety in America is to fire crooked Joe Biden, get him out November 5th. We don't want them coming into our country with contagious diseases, and they have it. And all of a sudden, you see these contagious diseases spreading. Once peaceful, suburban Michigan is really now, you're under an invasion. The former president also tried to blame President Biden for the murder of a Michigan woman who was killed by her undocumented immigrant boyfriend. But we should repeat that Trump campaign's inflammatory rhetoric suggesting some kind of migrant crime wave is not rooted in fact. Overall, violent crime rates are actually falling, according to the 2023 crime data from the FBI. Violent crime is down nationwide compared to the previous year. And the same is true in the big cities that Trump often pillars as dangerous, out-of-control Democrat-run communities. And while Trump often points to specific tragic events, there's no evidence that undocumented immigrants commit more violent crimes than the average American citizen. The Biden campaign accused Mr. Trump of playing politics with that tragedy in Michigan, while also criticizing him for rallying Republicans earlier this year to kill a bipartisan border deal in Congress so he could run on the issue. Here's more of what Trump said on the border in Michigan. No country, no country can withstand this invasion. There's no country in the world that who withstand the, the cost of this and maybe more important than actual dollar cost, the, the cost that it's doing. It's wrecking our civilization. It's destroying our country. And they send the people, by the way, that they want out. They're not sending their finest. We will stop the plunder, rape, slaughter, and destruction of our American suburbs, cities, and towns. We will end deadly sanctuary cities immediately. The former president is now off to Green Bay, Wisconsin, where he'll hold a campaign rally later tonight. It comes after he falsely asserted in a local radio interview that he won the 2020 election in Wisconsin and claimed without proof to have evidence that the election was rigged. It is only April, and the former president's rhetoric has already darkened significantly and without really much pushback from inside his party. If this is where we are in April, where will we be in November? NBC's Shaq Brewster was at the former president's event that just wrapped up in Michigan. Also with me on set is NBC's Garrett Haake, who follows the Trump campaign for us. Uh, so, Shaq, you are there on the ground. I mean, how was Donald Trump's language received today in Michigan? Well, Ryan, this was an invitation-only crowd. So you had and saw elected officials. You saw members of law enforcement. You saw Republican Party leaders. So you heard a lot of applause. You saw people nodding as you heard the former president step up and continue the rhetoric that we've been hearing for a long time. And you see it behind me in the shot. You see it says, Stop Biden's Border Bloodbath. The former president leaned into that controversial phrase that has been uh, front of mind for many people for a couple of weeks now since he first used it. He made a nod to the fact 
fact that people were uh, upset by it before. So he's really leaning into the controversy that this has caused. So the folks in the room, they have definitely shown that they this is something they, they wanted to hear and leaned into that messaging. But really, in places like Michigan, specifically here in Kent County, the question is not how the people in the room respond and react. It's really how the people outside of the room react. What do they hear? Kent County is one of those counties that Donald Trump won in 2016. Joe Biden flipped it in 2020. And I spoke to people. We knew this messaging was coming up. I spoke to people in town about the messaging, about what former President Trump was saying on different radio calls and got to, tried to get a sense of how they would react to it. And I'll tell you, of those swing voters, people who said they voted for Trump in the past but voted for him in uh, February during the primary, some of them told me that it's for, it's that rhetoric that is making them walk away from former President Trump. Others are saying this is exactly what they're looking for. So that's going to be the question, how this messaging that he's continuing and, as you mentioned, escalating, how that lands with these swing voters in these crucial battleground counties and battleground states. Uh, and Shaq, this is the first time that we've heard Trump uh, since a New York judge expanded a gag order against a former president. That, did that yeah. seem to at least tamp down his rhetoric, rhetoric as it relates to his legal cases? Maybe, perhaps. I mean, he talked about a lot on stage there. He got into the election. He got into immigration. He talked about a lot of different issues, but he also brought up that gag order. He also brought up uh, having to pay the bond. Uh, earlier today. He did not reference the uh, gag order in terms of the restrictions. He didn't lean into that aggressively, but uh, it's, it remains to be seen whether or not it really had an impact. I think you usually see him re react to that when we see him usually walking out of the courtroom or being asked about it directly. That will be something to watch to see if his language pulls back a little bit, if he stops mentioning the judge's family now that he as, is gagged and is required uh, not to. So that's something that will, uh, will remain to be seen. But he did definitely mention at least some of the legal fights that he's been in, and he's been connecting it with uh, the situation and crime that he's been referencing as he was on stage. Okay, Jack Brewster, thank you for that report. So let's turn now to Garrett. It's interesting the campaign was twisting itself in knots to try and explain yeah. <clears throat> what he meant by bloodbath, saying it wasn't as bad as people were interpreting it. Now they're putting it on campaign placards yep. as he's speaking. Uh, he keeps talking about this bloodbath, but the statistics don't really bear that out. Do, I mean, does that even matter? Uh, this, no, not to his supporters is the short answer. Every time he does this, I think about something we've heard Nancy Pelosi say, which is that the plural of anecdote is not data. Mm -hmm. And to Donald Trump, the anecdotes here are the point. If you're loved one was killed by an undocumented immigrant. It is very personal to you. And he does a pretty good job of mastering another thing you and I both have talked about a lot, which is local news and local media and going into places where there is a big story, there is a big singular anecdote, and trying to capture the feeling around that in a way that might ignite that population in Grand Rapids, in Kent County, where this is a big deal, or in Rome, Georgia, where he was talking about the Lake and Riley case a few weeks ago. So while those kinds of things can be enormously effective, the idea of a migrant crime wave is not backed up in the data. But the Trump campaign will tell you every one of these individual crimes committed by an undocumented immigrant would not have been committed if that particular undocumented immigrant weren't there. And if they can capture those little pockets of anger, they think that's something they can use to their advantage. Yeah, it's a, such a great point you raise because I think uh, from 30,000 foot, this looks like a, the way he's talking about this would turn off independent voters. But in each one of these little communities that's been directly impacted by it, this actually may help him with independent voters. That's right. And remember, we're not running a national election. There is no such thing as a national election. There are lots of little tiny elections and statewide elections that will decide this. And, you know, in Kent County, is a perennial battleground where, you know, the relative risk of losing a handful of people, a county that he already lost, is perhaps outweighed by making sure that your people are there and that maybe there are some of those suburban moms who are worried about that kind of crime in their community. I mean, Wisconsin, where he's going to go next, is a state where the margin was smaller than the average attendance of a Brewers game, I'm pretty mm -hmm. sure. It was like 20,000 people. Mm -hmm. So every a little bit of this at the margin matters. And I, my own view, having covered Donald Trump for a long time and watched the way the Republican Party has changed and the way I think about this is, if you're somebody who's been turned off by Donald Trump's rhetoric, you were turned off eight years yeah. ago. You're not suddenly waking up today and saying, boy, I really liked this Trump guy going back to 2016, <laughs> but now he's taken it too far on immigration. I think that ship has sailed, and that's certainly the way the Trump campaign is approaching it. We, we've been keeping your a seat in the booth warm on Capitol Hill. I know it's, it's been a while since you've been there, but if you can hearken back to your Capitol Hill correspondent uh, expertise here. He's talking so much about the border. Mm -hmm. uh, there are still some House Republicans that are flirting with this 
this idea of tying border uh, provisions to the Ukraine supplemental bill. Uh, is there any shot? Does he play a role in perhaps trying to find some way to get a border bill that could actually pass the House and Senate? Well, I think there's no uh, reason for him to play any role in getting something passed right now, nor do I think he's going to. I mean, I think you see different sets of incentives here. For House Republicans on their two-year terms right now, who are currently in office, they need to at least look like they're trying to solve this problem and take it seriously. Donald Trump does not have to look like he's trying to solve this problem at all. His job as he sees it, is to highlight how bad the immigration issue has become and to say, as he's perfectly comfortable saying, only I can fix it. And that by electing him, you could put something strong enough in place to actually seal up the border, solve the issue, however you want to look at it. I think, you know, having covered both of these beats, there's basically a 0% chance of any border-related anything being passed uh, while Joe Biden is president, or at least while Donald Trump is still running against him. Maybe in a second Biden term, you, you would see House Republicans decide they've got to do something, having talked about it for so many years. But right now, between now and November, 0.0. Uh, .0. You know, I take your point that he's probably past the point where he can offend someone that might even consider voting for him. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting that he's decided to get even darker. Every time we think he's gotten as dark as he possibly can, he finds a darker shade of dark. Yeah. It, what, what's the motivation behind that? I think that's how he generally feels about these issues, but I also think, and this is consistent when you look at everything we've seen Trump say and do since he wrapped up the nomination, right? This is not somebody who's going to go chase voters in the center. Mm -hmm. We've had his, his surrogates, we've had Laura Trump say he's not going to go chase Nikki Haley voters. He's going to be who he is, and he's going to try to use the specter of how bad he and many of his supporters believe the Joe Biden administration is going to push people back into his camp rather than him going out and reaching them. So I think there's no amount of darkness that gets too too dark here. I think you're, we have to think about this not as some effort to go out and like win this battle for this big middle. It's a sort of like lower the floor for everybody and hope that your low floor is slightly higher than Joe Biden's low floor if voters hate everybody. Right, right. Scare enough people to the ballots. Happy Tuesday. Yeah. Thanks, Garrett. Well, as uh, we said, the next stop on former President Trump's campaign schedule today is in Wisconsin, which is also one of several states that's holding a presidential primary today. That is actually still happening. Mr. Trump will be holding a rally in Green Bay in a couple of hours. As the Republican Party there and other key swing states are hoping to encourage their voters to change the way they vote, trying to encourage voting by mail, something that's be become a significant advantage for Democrats in recent years. But the effort is hitting some major roadblocks, in part because the Republican Party's standard bearer himself continues to rail against voting by mail and cast doubt on the process. Mail-in voting is totally corrupt. Get that through your head. It has to be. The votes, I mean, it has to be. If you have mail-in voting, you automatically have fraud. Anytime you have mail-in ballots, anytime you have mail-out or mail-in, they call them different names, anytime the mail is involved, you're going to have cheating. That's all just in the last month or so. We should note that last week, RNC co-chair Laura Trump told NBC News that former President Trump is now very much embracing early voting, despite what you just saw there. Joining me now is senior national politics reporter Matt Dixon. He's one of the reporters behind the new NBC reporting about the resistance that Republicans are facing as they push early voting. Uh, Matt, this seems like a very difficult task if you're kind of a, a rank-and-file Republican Party operative trying to get people to vote and you uh, are losing one of the key tools in your arsenal uh, by allowing them to vote by mail. How are they trying to, to have, have it both ways, not push back on Donald Trump, but then still convince their voters that it's okay to cast a, a, a vote by mail? Nearly the universal message from operatives, candidates, those who are in favor of Republicans voting by mail is, hey, Democrats are doing it, so so should we. Uh, vote by mail has become incredibly popular. It, it, during the pandemic, it really spiked, but even during the 2022 midterms, it hit record pre-pandemic levels. So it is a tool, as you had mentioned, that is really important politically. Democrats have invested heavily in vote by mail programs over the years. Republicans used to. Republicans, especially in places like Florida, really helped create the first first end of the, the vote by mail programs. But since since Trump has kind of come on the scene and made comments like the one you've shown, Republicans have pulled back from that. So now the now it's to convince their voters to go ahead and say it's okay to vote by mail. And the one message they're really hammering on is, hey, if the other guys are doing it, we need to do it too. And so uh, talk to me a little bit about the investments that they're making. I know you touched on it a little bit, but they are, there is a specifically an effort that they have uh, underway and they're actually putting some money behind it. 
Yeah, well, th this is where it gets kind of complicated, though, because the National Republican Party is going to have far less money than National Democrats. And in a presidential election cycle, state by state, and, and we don't run national elections, we run state elections, rely on a lot of money from the National Party to do things like vote by mail programs. So that money's really got to roll downhill. And right now, Republicans are struggling to raise money and they're paying for other things. As, as, you know, a lot, of, a lot of talk has been President Trump's legal bills. So the idea that, that they, they're going to invest in this is complicated by the fact that they don't have much money. We have seen state level uh, Republican parties, notably in Pennsylvania, who've started doing their own thing and they've started really, really pushing the idea that Republicans should vote by mail. But that entire process is complicated by lack of money. And it's not just the presidential race that we're talking about here, right? Every House seat is up. There's a, a lot of key Senate races, down ballot races across the board. Uh, if you're a, a Republican right now, you need people to vote by mail, right? Without question, we, we talked to Senate candidates in Pennsylvania and Nevada, two very key states. They're worried about this, and as are others across the country. They are they are of the, the belief, it's kind of the operatives and the, the political professionals and the candidates who say, we really need to do this, we really need to vote by mail, or Democrats are going to keep beating us. The, uh, they got to get that message into some of the, the uh, you know, the, the grassroots and the fervent Trump supporters who take their cues from the president, as opposed to listening to the operative types of the Republican National Committee. So getting those sort of base voters to buy into the message is right now what is most key. Okay, Matt, Dix Matt Dixon on the ground there in Wisconsin. Matt, thanks for that. Check out that story on NBCNews.com. Coming up, tragedy in Gaza. Seven aid workers from one of the only organizations in the world delivering much-needed food to Gaza killed by an Israeli airstrike. The White House today says it is outraged. The latest on the incident and the fallout is next. Plus, if it's Tuesday, someone is voting somewhere We'll take you inside the push to oust a city council member in Oklahoma who attended the 2017 Unite the Right white supremacist rally in Charlottesville. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. Seven aid workers with the World Central Kitchen, including one U.S. Canadian dual citizen, were tragically killed by an Israeli strike today, raising serious concerns about how Israel is conducting its military operations and threatening to make an already dire humanitarian situation in Gaza even worse. In a video message released this morning, Prime Minister Netanyahu acknowledged Israeli forces unintentionally hit innocent people in the Gaza Strip, adding that it happens in war and vowing to do everything so that it doesn't happen again. Our NBC News team took this video in Gaza showing the damaged aid truck as well as the scene at the hospital. And we do want to warn our audience, some of these images are disturbing. You can see the bodies of those aid workers being brought to the hospital as medics carried them to the morgue, as many of their World Central Kitchen colleagues mourned their loss while trying to console one another about the tragedy. The strike, to str strike drew strong reaction and condemnation, including from celebrity chef Jose Andres, who's the founder of the World Central Kitchen, who said he was heartbroken. The White House also reacting today, expressing outrage and saying the U.S. will continue to press Israel to ensure the safety of humanitarian workers. We were outraged to learn of an IDF strike that killed a number of civilian humanitarian workers yesterday from the World Central Kitchen, which has been relentless in working to get food to those who are hungry in Gaza, and quite frankly, around the world. We send our deepest condolences to their families and loved ones. More than 200 aid workers have been killed in this conflict, making it one of the worst for aid workers in recent history. This incident is emblematic of a larger problem and evidence of why distribution of aid in Gaza has been so challenging. NBC News international correspondent Raf Sanchez has more from the fallout from that strike. Israel facing mounting questions today about how its forces killed those seven aid workers from World Central Kitchen, the victims from around the world, Australia, the UK, Poland, Gaza, and also at least one U.S. Canadian dual citizen. Now, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is saying this was a tragic case of Israeli forces unintentionally killing non-combatants. Israel has promised to mount an investigation at the highest levels to find out what happened here. But World Central Kitchen, the charity founded by Chef Jose Andres, saying that the killings are unforgivable. And they are asking 
how this could have happened given that the three cars in this convoy, at least two of them, were clearly marked with the logo of the World Central Kitchen. They were driving in what's called a deconflicted zone, a zone that's supposed to be safe for humanitarian organizations to operate in. And the charity is saying that they spoke to the Israeli military ahead of time about the movement of those vehicles. I asked an Israeli government spokesman, given that the organization did everything it possibly could have, apparently, to signal to the Israeli military that it was not a threat. How is it possible that these seven aid workers still killed by Israeli bombs? This spokesman saying to me that this was an unintentional strike. It was a mistake that happened in the chaos of war. Now, it may have been a mistake, but it was far from an isolated incident, according to the United Nations, which says more than 200 humanitarians have been killed in Gaza since the start of the war, the vast majority of them Palestinians. That is a toll that shatters previous records. World Central Kitchen pausing its operations in Gaza in the aftermath of these killings, and we are already seeing the real-world impact of that. There were a number of ships heading from Gaza to Cyprus, carrying aid that was supposed to be heading towards northern Gaza, an area the UN says is on the brink of famine, an area where our crews have seen parents trying to keep their children fed with grass, with barley, meant for feeding animals. Those ships have now turned around with only a portion of the aid delivered. They are heading back to Cyprus, and the impact of that is going to be felt by a lot of very desperate people in Gaza today. Back to you. Prof Sanchez, thank you for that reporting. And for more on the U.S. reaction, I'm joined now by NBC News White House correspondent Mike Memoli. Uh, so we saw uh, John Kirby's comments on this, but what more is the White House saying about this tragic incident in Gaza? Well, Ryan, we've seen that the White House has both an official and, frankly, a political relationship with Jose Andres. They've really lifted up the work that he's been doing, obviously, in Gaza, but across the world over the last few years. And so this is a moment, as we've been measuring the degrees of daylight between the Israeli government and the U.S. government, where we could potentially see this get even worse. John Kirby at the podium today uh, speaking quite forcefully, sometimes though needing the pressure of tough questions from the press court to get there, but to speak critically of this moment, but also to say that Israel is going to conduct an investigation. They want to let that investigation speak for itself. What I think this moment calls for is what behind the scenes might be the breaking point for President Biden, who has made clear his frustrations mm-hmm. uh, with Prime Minister Netanyahu, but has not been willing to do things like condition military assistance going forward. Even today, Kirby refusing to do so. But is this a breaking point? I mean, it's an awful tragedy on any level, but it it comes just a couple of days after the prime minister suggested that it wouldn't be that difficult for people to evacuate Rafa uh, ahead of their strike there. Uh, Here you have a situation where you have an organization that the IDF knew was going to be in a specific location, yet they were still the victim of an atrocity like this. I mean, that more than anything demonstrates how complicated this is for the White House. That's right. Kirby making that point, as was Secretary Blinken when speaking about this abroad today. And you think back to the meeting that happened yesterday, this virtual conversation between U.S. officials and their Israeli counterparts. This is exactly why they want to have a tough, detailed discussion of what a potential ground invasion looks like. The U.S. officials saying they've been giving them lots of options that would avoid the need for a ground invasion because of the humanitarian toll that this is taking. We, we look at what President Biden was just saying, by the way, at that fundraiser in New York with the three presidents last week. Yeah. He was saying much more needs to get done to get aid into Gaza, uh, that he's also working diplomatic channels furiously with other allies in the region to make sure that the situation doesn't escalate. And of course, this isn't the only hotspot. Uh, that we're dealing with in the Middle East. Another strike, uh, the strike on the Iranian consulate in Syria. Is the administration worried that the war could expand as a result of this? That's why they took this, really is an extraordinary step, according to reporting from Courtney Kuby, Carol Lee, of communicating directly yesterday with the Iranians to make clear, one, that they were only briefed about this plan when the Israeli planes were in the air, but that they did not have advanced knowledge of this. This Anytime you have any kind of situation like this in the Mideast, the fears of escalation are profound. And this moment yesterday uh, led to that dramatic step on the part of the Biden administration. 
And, uh, you know, it's primary day in Wisconsin. And if it's Tuesday. If it's Tuesday, right? Somebody, somebody's voting somewhere. Uh, President Biden, uh, once again, facing an, an uninstructed movement. So there, this is basically a protest vote against him in Wisconsin. This is a, another in a series of these that have happened. They've kind of brushed them off. They've tr said they're trying to listen to these folks that are upset. How worried are they that this is a bigger problem? I was speaking to a campaign official today who said they feel like March went as good as they could expect. You start with the State of the Union address. You go through that campaign blitz. He went through all the battleground states. They have been, though, closely monitoring these uh, uncommitted votes, some version of them in, in several different states. Minnesota, of course, uh, was the biggest, about 18 percent. Michigan was the real shocker uh, to put it on the map with 100,000 votes. Wisconsin is where they have, been, I think, the organizers of this effort have put in their biggest effort. And Wisconsin is important, again, as a potential battleground state uh, this November. So the Biden campaign very much looking closely at this. And it's why you also see it in the White House schedule today. Typically, in the last Years we've seen a big reception around Ramadan, an iftar dinner that is dramatically scaled down at the White House this year. Okay, Mike Memley, thank you for your reporting. We appreciate it. Let's turn now to Baltimore, where crews appear to be making progress in their efforts to clear the Patapsco River after last week's bridge collapse. Maryland Governor Wes Moore says two temporary channels have now been opened to allow commercial traffic into the river. The governor, though, cautioned that it will be a while before things are back to normal in Baltimore. And I'm thankful that after only a week after the collapse, we have pathways and channels so commercial traffic can now move through. But I do want to be clear. We are still a long way from being able to get the size and the cadence of the commercial traffic back to where it was before the collapse. The Navy, meanwhile, released these sonar images today of the wreckage deep below the surface of the Patapsco River. Officials say the water is still too murky for divers to be able to see that wreckage on their own. Up next, Florida, Florida, Florida. All eyes are on the Sunshine State as Democrats look to leverage the issue of abortion in Biden's campaign push toward November. The panel is next. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. The Biden campaign is now saying it can win Florida in November, despite the state trending Republican in recent years. It comes after the Florida Supreme Court paved the way for a six-week abortion ban to take effect in the state, while also ruling that the issue will be on the ballot this November. In a memo first shared with NBC News, the Biden campaign says the issue of abortion will be a key to making inroads in the state where former President Trump beat Mr. Biden in 2020, and where Republican Governor Ron DeSantis, who signed the six-week six abortion ban into law last year, won by 20 points in 2022. The Biden campaign's optimism show, uh, comes as polls show a majority of the country says that abortion should be legal. And as efforts to protect or expand abortion rights could appear on the ballot in eight other states, including some key battlegrounds. Just this morning, the group behind Arizona's ballot amendment say that they've exceeded the signature threshold. Joining me now is our panel, NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ali Vitale, Democratic pollster Cornell Belcher, he's also an NBC political analyst, and Lance Trover, Republican strategist and former spokesperson for Doug Burgum's uh, presidential campaign. Ali, uh, I recall the last time Florida was competitive. You and I spent 17 days <laughs> Living there. Living in that hotel. <laughs> That's right, covering uh, the recount there in uh, 2018. I remember at the time Democrats being worried that uh, Florida would never be competitive again yeah. if they couldn't win that election. They were unable to. That entered in Ron DeSantis and Rick Scott. Yeah. Could Florida be competitive now that abortion's on the ballot? I mean, because you and I remember almost spending Thanksgiving together in <laughs> Tallahassee in 2018. The fact that we're here in this place debating a six-week ban, a 15-week ban, the remaking of Florida in a ruby red color as opposed to purple, I mean, all of that hinged on, what was it, 0.25% of mm -hmm. the vote in the Gillum-DeSantis race? I mean, elections have consequences, and we are watching them play out through the state of Florida. I think what's going to be difficult is we've never seen someone like Rick Scott, for example, run in a presidential year, so he's never had to see the presidential either drag or pull. We'll see how that works for him. But look, abortion has been across the board a motivator. It's been true in ruby red states like Ohio and Kentucky. 
Florida is red. I wouldn't put it ruby, at least not yet. But <laughs> I, I do think that this is going to be something that it makes it hard to guess what it is because women's rage is something that's kind of unquantifiable, but it is energizing and it is motivating. And Democrats are counting on that. So, Cornell, I want to play some of the ad the, the Biden campaign released on this issue as they try and tap into it. Take a listen. Because for 54 years, they were trying to get Roe v. Wade terminated, and I did it, and I'm proud to have done it. Donald Trump ran to overturn Roe v. Wade. Now, in 2024, he's running to pass a national ban on a woman's right to choose. I'm running to make Roe v. Wade the law of the land again. Is that effective, Cornell? Well, look, I, I remember when, when Florida was, was really competitive, too. It was 2012 when we were winning it, when I was part of the Obama <laughs> campaign. And so look at what, let's look at the numbers. Look at what we know this issue does. Take Michigan, for example, when we had that ballot initiative in Michigan. Going into the midterm, a lot of people talked about, well, Michigan is a, a state that Republicans should do really well in. Republicans yeah. should do really well in the midterm. That initiative drove youth turnout. We had the highest youth turnout in Michigan of anywhere in the country. Now, let's break down Florida. Florida is a state where turnout really, really matters, right? Go to uh, 2020 when, when Trump won it. 32% of the electorate were 65 plus seniors. We know a lot of seniors live in, live in Florida. What was that turnout in 2012? They were only roughly 24, 25% of that, right? So you get a huge uh, surge among base and youth voters. This issue has the potential, it has an Obama-like potential to surge uh, younger voters and dim base voters, and that gives Democrats a, a shot in Florida. So, Lance, uh, the Trump campaign has tried to say that he's not in favor of a nationwide ban, that he specifically just wants this decision to be made by the states. But we have a state like Florida, where the six-week ban is among the most strict in the country. Is that argument something that resonates with voters? Well, it's obviously a big issue, but I, if we talk about numbers, Republicans hold a voter registration advantage of 855,000 in that state. So that is a massive uh, uh, delta, if you will. I think voters are savvy enough on this issue. I think it's possible that a voter can walk into the voting booth and say, look, I can make a statement about abortion in my state, and I may vote for somebody else who, while he does, I don't agree with that person on abortion, I also, but I do agree with them on immigration and the economy. I think it's very possible. Just two things. First, you and I both know this, and I think all of us here too. Democrats have sort of like let the entire party atrophy in the state of Florida yes. over the course of the yes. last eight years. So they're kind of building from nothing. The idea that it's winnable is tough. But I also think, and I, you brought up Michigan, this week they repealed surrogacy bans in the state, which on its face, to a casual viewer, might have nothing to do with the abortion debate. But it all fall, falls under the reproductive health care and freedoms umbrella. And I think that voters are very tuned into that in those swing states like Michigan, where Gretchen Whitmer is trying to build on what she's done, but then also in states like Florida, where they're trying to draw a real contrast between six-week ban DeSantis and 24-week uh, amendment that they're trying to put into their constitution. I mean, these are real contrasts that voters are very aware of what each side stands for, and now they just get to choose. And it's very fair. I mean, tactically, look, Florida's a country. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Florida, Florida, Same with Texas. Florida, yeah. Texas is a country. So the ideal, uh, so, so yes, it takes an awful lot of money. Uh, and, and so for the Biden campaign, which help, thankfully, they have a big cash advantage. But look, from a campaign standpoint, what states are you going to spend less money in that you know you have to win to have a better chance in so that you can make that, 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 uh, that, that huge investment in Florida? So it is a tough real-world campaign decision. Yeah. So uh, Republicans probably don't want to talk about abortion, but Lance, they do want to talk about immigration. And it seems as though President Trump brings that up every opportunity that he has. Uh, talking about it again today, now using the term bloodbath on these campaign placards. Uh, is that okay? Or is this something that Republicans can identify with? Or does he risk going too far in, in using some of the language that he's used when it comes to this issue? Well, I, I heard Garrett, who was on earlier. I mean, the, the, the voters separate the rhetoric from the policies often with Donald Trump. If, that, if they did not, I'm not sure he would have been president in 2016. Uh, voters know where he is on this stuff. They know that his rhetoric is tough on these issues, but he's still polling ahead or with uh, Joe Biden right now. So, I mean, yeah, they know the rhetoric that's out there, but again, they kind of separate the policy from the rhetoric, and that's why he's still leading.
Is, is there enough with independent voters, though? Does he need those independent voters? Well, I think that's a, that's, we'll see that play out in, in due time. But I do know, and having looked at polling in other congressional districts throughout the country, particularly in the Midwest, this immigration issue is huge. And in some cases, it's passing up the economy. Mm -hmm. the, the problem is, what you pointed out, is, is that the independent and moderate swath of voters. I mean, look, I'm not going to play the polling game, right, because we throw, oh, he's polling ahead. Mm -hmm. Polls right now don't matter, and I'm a pollster, right? <laughs> they're not, they're not, they're not predictive of anything. So what Donald Trump has to do is he has to grow beyond, well, look, we've seen a couple elections now. He's a 47, maybe 48 percent proposition. Can you get elected president 47%? Yeah, you can, but it's not probable, right? Can lightning strike twice? Yes. But no, he has to actually grow his base of support. This is not language where you're going to grow and be able to pull in more moderate middle of the road voters, where when you look at Obama and you look at then where Biden did, they dominated the moderate middle swath of the electorate. And this sort of language just does not appeal to them. I, I think back to 2004 uh, when George W. Bush was running for re-election and all these states put same-sex marriage yes. initiatives yeah. on the ballot. And obviously the opinion of the country of same-sex marriage in 2004 dramatically different than what it is 20 years ago. Could abortion play the same kind of role in this election? I definitely think so, because if I look at the last 10 years as I've been covering abortion access, the thing that's so striking to me is we're finally in this moment, finally, depending on who you talk to, being celebrated or not, but being post-Roe is something that has never been tested. It's only been theorized about. And so we're watching the cases sort of be made in real time electorally. When you look at ballot initiatives, and again, you go back to Ohio, which is a red state. They did this election on a random Tuesday in August. They gave <laughs> folks like three months notice and nowhere in the ballot initiative was the word abortion. Mm -hmm. Folks just knew. That really does tell me that when three million people are turning out in the dog days of summer, there's something to that. And in a red state, to see that kind of action on that issue, yeah, I do think this is one of those issues that makes it impossible to predict because mm -hmm. we've never been here before. Well, I think that's why if, if you're a Republican candidate, the one thing you need to do is be very clear on where you stand on this issue. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying you need to make it the center point of your campaign, but be clear on where you stand on this issue and not let yourself get defined by the Democrats. Is there a possibility Democrats can go too far on it, Cornell? Well, this was the conversation we heard in the last midterm, and, and evidence says no, mm -hmm. yeah. right? This is something, this is something, there's not a horror contrast, right? Donald Trump says, I'm the person who got rid of Roe Ro v. Wade. Many want to do it. I'm the one who got it, got it done. There's not an easier contrast than that yeah. anywhere. He, he made something happen that the vast majority of Americans did not want to happen, and we're going to continue to hit him and every Republican down the line on it. But you're right. Republicans don't want to talk about it. Who wins the campaign? He or she who defines the debate wins the debate. They want it to be about immigration. We want it to be about, about reproductive rights. Okay, we'll see what happens in November. Allie, Cornell, <laughs> Nance, thank you guys all for being here. We appreciate it. After the break, my one-on-one -on -one interview with a House Republican pushing his party for a vote to get Ukraine the critical aid it needs in the war against Russia. Congressman Mike Lawler joins me next. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. The prospects of Ukraine aid remain murky in the House. Speaker Johnson this weekend seemed to float that a new Ukraine bill that would be a loan that would loan Ukraine money from seized Russian assets and also contain changes to U.S. energy policy. The Senate's already passed a bill that contains assistance to Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan that has bipartisan support in the House. But Johnson does not seem to be eager to put that bill on the floor. While weighing his next step, the speaker must also consider the threat of a potential motion to oust him hanging over his head with Georgia Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene threatening Johnson with the same fate as former Speaker Kevin McCarthy. Joining me now to talk about all of this is New York Republican Congressman Mike Lawler. He is, of course, a member of the House Foreign Relations Committee. So, Congressman, over the weekend, you said that you believe there will be a vote on Ukraine aid when the House returns. Tell me wh how, what fashion you think that will come in. Will it be the Senate bill? I know you have a bill that you're working on with Brian Fitzpatrick. Or does the speaker offer up something different? Well, uh, prior to going on the Easter recess, uh, I, and along with Brian Fitzpatrick, Jared Golden, uh, and a number of my colleagues in a bipartisan way, introduced defending borders, defending democracies, which would provide $66 billion in legal aid to Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan. Uh, we have all signed a discharge petition to bring that bill to the floor and have been in touch with the speaker on several occasions to try and work through uh, and build consensus. Uh, there's no question we need to bring a bill to the floor. Uh, 
you know, Iran, China, and Russia are not our allies. They're not our friends. They have engaged in an unholy alliance that has sought to undermine and destabilize the United States and the free world. Uh, and we need to support our allies in this time of need. So I am hopeful that the speaker uh, will bring a bill to the floor. Uh, ideally, it would be one that includes uh, you know, uh, aid for Israel, Ukraine, and Taiwan, uh, as well as border provisions, including Title 42 uh, and Remain in Mexico, which is the bill that we have outlined. Um, but, you know, we all have to find compromise here. Uh, we're in a divided government, and we need to negotiate. Uh, the speaker ultimately uh, is going to be the decider in, in what legislation comes to the floor. Uh, but my hope is that we get a vote on legislation as soon as we get back. It seems as though that the speaker's been pretty guarded in his feelings about this, uh, just kind of hinting without specifics about what type of bill he might support. He talked about this possibility of a loan, uh, the, the idea of leveraging their natural gas reserves. Have you specifically talking to, talked to the speaker about what his plans are for Ukraine? Do you know of anybody else that spoke to the speaker about it? Or is this not a conversation you'll have until you return next week? Now, there's been lots of conversations over the last few weeks. Uh, obviously, the issue of a loan has come up, as well as uh, the Repo Act, which would use seized Russian assets uh, to help pay for uh, some of the aid to Ukraine, uh, which, you know, in and of itself, I have no uh, qualms about. Uh, with respect to energy, look, this is critical. Uh, Iran is the greatest state sponsor of terror. Over the last three years, uh, Iranian petroleum sales have increased by $88 billion. Uh, certainly, we don't want uh, other uh, countries reliant on Russian or Iranian uh, gas and oil. Uh, so that is something from a national security standpoint we do have to deal with realistically. It's why I introduced the SHIP Act, uh, which would implement secondary sanctions on the purchaser of Iranian petroleum, the greatest purchaser of which is China. So this is something that, from a national security standpoint, should be part of the conversation. Uh, and so I certainly you know, appreciate the speaker's position on that. OK, let's talk, though, about this, the position the speaker finds himself in. Uh, there is this motion to vacate threat that's hanging over the speaker right now. Uh, it's specifically tied to him putting Ukraine aid on the floor. Um, how, what is your feeling about this? It, it, could he be in trouble if Ukraine aid actually does get to the floor? Uh, look, as I've said, uh, it's idiotic uh, and will do nothing to uh, advance the cause uh, of conservatism uh, and, in fact, will undermine our House Republican majority. If people haven't learned that lesson uh, from last year, I don't know what will make them learn that lesson. But uh, the bottom line is this. The Speaker has to do what is right by the country. He understands that. Uh, and he knows that we need to get a bill on the floor. Obviously, he's seeking to build consensus within the conference, and that's his job. Uh, we have a House Republican majority for a reason, uh, and you want to build consensus within the conference. So he's trying to do that. Um, I think my colleagues need to recognize that, uh, you know, removing the speaker is not going to stop Ukraine aid uh, from from happening. It's not going to do anything other than undermine our majority. Uh, and so really, uh, the stupidity should stop. So let's talk now about the issue of abortion. And, and you said over the weekend that, quote, people want reasonableness. They don't want extremism on this particular issue. But I'm sure you saw this week the Florida Supreme Court paving the way for the state's six-week abortion ban, with some exceptions for rape, incest, and the life of the mother. Uh, do you consider that a reasonable standard? No, and I think, uh, obviously, uh, in a state like Florida, uh, we're going to see uh, how voters respond to that. I, I think when you're looking at these issues, even in red states, uh, voters are making it very clear uh, that they don't want uh, extremism when it comes to this issue. They want reasonableness. They don't support the Democratic Party position, which is abortion up to the moment of birth, gender selection for abortion, you know, against parental notification. Uh, that's extreme. Uh, that's a position that my opponent, Mondaire Jones, supports, for instance. Uh, they want reasonableness. It's why, for instance, I've signed on to legislation uh, to protect IVF treatments, uh, because this is something where millions of families all across this country struggle with infertility. They want to become parents, uh, and we want to help them uh, do that. If And if IVF treatments are uh, the avenue by which they can do so, that's something that should be protected. 
I think you're going to see across this country uh, in states where this is on the ballot, uh, voters are going to make very clear they want reasonableness. They do not want extremism on this so, issue. So if I can uh, get some clarity on that. So do you not support any sort of for federal ban on abortion or any federal restrictions? You think it should be left up to the states, but that you, you feel differently when it comes to IVF. Do you believe there should be a, a federal protection for the practice of IVF? So I've been very clear. I will not support legislation that would uh, have a federal ban on abortion. Uh, obviously, based on the Dobbs decision, uh, abortion rights are, are up to each state. Uh, and so states are making that determination. And with it, the voters are making determinations in those states, whether it's on the ballot uh, or with respect to uh, their representatives in the state legislature. Uh, I do believe, look, we want to promote a culture of life uh, certainly. And we want to help people uh, with critical medical treatments that would help uh, ensure that we have uh, the right to to become parents, to have uh, children. And that's what uh, the IVF protections are there for. Uh, and so I have signed on to legislation to do that. Uh, the Alabama court, I believe, was wrong in deciding it the way that they did. Uh, the legislature there acted. Uh, but uh, we want to make sure that uh, IVF treatments are protected nationwide, and that's why I've signed on to legislation to do that. Okay. Congressman Michael Lawler, we packed in a lot. We appreciate it, sir. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. Still to come, meet the Oklahoma City Council member who's facing a recall election today over his ties to white nationalism. We're on the ground in Eden, Oklahoma next. We're watching Meet the Press now. It may be primary day in half a dozen states, but we're also following a recall election today in one small Oklahoma town. An aided Oklahoma City Council member is facing a recall election over his ties to white nationalists. Pictures reveal that the council member, Judd Blevins, was part of the Unite the Right march in Charlottesville in 2017. NBC News' uh, Brandy Zaransky tried to get some answers from Blevins about his past conduct following a recent city council meeting. You were a leader in an Oklahoma chapter of a white nationalist organization, and I want to know if you have any explanation to that. Come here, come here. Why did you march and unite the right? Why did you hold a tiki torch? And Brandy Zadrowski joins me now. So, Brandy, explain to us who Judd Blevins is. Well, Judd Blevins is an Iraq war vet. He uh, works with his family's roofing business here in Enid, Oklahoma, and he is a sitting city council member. He is also, as you just mentioned, um, from 2017 to at least 2019, was an active member of a group called Identity Europa, which was the largest white nationalist group in the U.S. during the time of the so-called alt-right. Um, he was an active member, a recruiter, an organizer. He led the Oklahoma State chapter and um, now, because of that, he is up for recall in um, this polling place right behind me. So who discovered that he was part of the Unite the Right march in Charlottesville? This is really interesting because this information was actually out there. It was available on the Internet, but it was available in some of the leftier, more progressive spaces. And um, people in Enid generally are pretty conservative folks. So there are some progressive people in Enid, and they were the ones who found this information, and they uh, took it to city council meetings. They uh, organized protests. They did not let it go. And this has happened for about a year now where they have just not let this thing go. They've gone to city council meetings and sort of taken over public comment, reading his secret messages on secret white supremacist forums, showing pictures of him at the Unite the Right rally. And these folks are called the Enid Social Justice Committee. So these are really the people who are responsible for this recall today. They went and got signatures and they filed the recall petition. And it seems as though even Eden's mayor seems to be opposed to Blevins keeping his job. What did he tell you? Yeah, the mayor, and it should be stated, is a conservative Republican himself. A lot of conservative Republicans, now that they know this information, are really drawing a line and in some ways finding ways to unify with some of the most progressive citizens here. And the mayor told me last month when we met that he had talked to Mr. Blevins and asked him straight up about his white nationalist ties because Blevins had already always sort of skirted the issue, said, I'm against racism, but not specifically addressed those ties. But he did 
started in a private meeting with the mayor. The mayor told us about it. And further, the mayor expressed a concern that Blevins is still associated with this group. He is concerned that he's associated with other white nationalists that have moved on into other groups who may be um, contributing to his campaign or um, helping him in some other way. A lot of white nationalist group during this whole chaos have been talking about Judd Blevins, convince, or suggesting that their members reach out to the mayor, reach out to city council members and the local paper to try to influence their, their, uh, the recall election. And, and do you have any sense of how it's going to turn out? I know you've been at that polling place all day, and there's probably not a po lot of polling, but is there a general vibe as to how today could go? Not a lot of polling. This is a very small race, right, with very big implications. But we've been standing outside this polling place all day. We've talked to dozens of people. And the vibe that I get from people who are willing to talk to us is that they didn't know, but now that they do, are ready to make a different choice. Okay. Brandy uh, Zedrazi, thank you so much for your reporting. We appreciate that. And uh, we'll be back tomorrow with more Meet the Press Now. But the news continues with Hallie Jackson right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.